Hello and welcome back to Microsoft Research's lecture series on race and technology. Uh, if you've been here before, welcome back. If you haven't, welcome. Um, re quick reminder that all of our past lectures are available to you on uh, YouTube. And if you've registered for this one, as you obviously have since you're here, you have access to all of them. Uh, my name is Nancy Bame. I'm a senior principal research manager at Microsoft Research in our New England lab. And for the last year or so, it's been my honor to host this series. I want to uh, acknowledge that uh, it's a collective endeavor and thank uh, the folks who helped organize it with me, including Charlton McElwain and Hannah Wallach and uh, Christopher Morris, as well as the folks who've helped organize it, like uh, Brittany Muller and Sean Witzel and today Brian. Ryan is here as well. Ryan, excuse me, is here as well. So thank you, everybody who has helped make this happen. Uh, we're hoping that this series helps to demonstrate the ways that race and technology construct one another, and we're hoping that by raising that kind of awareness, we can move toward building a more just and equitable future for us all. Um, Tawana Dillahunt, who's today's speaker, is somebody who works on the front lines of these questions around equity and technology, and we're really happy to have her with us today. Uh, her talk, as you can see, is called Building With Not For Case Studies of Community-Driven Employment Innovations. Uh, Tawana is currently spending a day a week with my group at Microsoft Research, and we've been thinking about community-driven design and, and the future of work together. Um, and it's just been I've learned so much from thinking with her. She's an associate professor when not with us at the University of Michigan School of Information, and she's also got a courtesy appointment in electrical engineering and computer science there. Uh, her work is at the intersection of HCI, human computer interaction. Uh, she thinks about that in terms of equity uh, and environmental, economic and social sustainability. Uh, she tries in her work and succeeds in her work to investigate and implement technologies that support the, the needs of marginalized people as they're seeking employment, as we'll hear about today, as well as in a range of other contexts. She's an inaugural recipient of the Skip Ellis Early Career Award, and she was recently named an ACM Distinguished Member, so go to Wana. She's got a PhD and MS in HCI from Carnegie Mellon, an MS in Computer Science from Oregon Health and Science University, and a BS in Computer Engineering from North Carolina State, and she's also got some history in industry, having spent seven years at Intel. So uh, let me leave it at that and let's hear from Tawana. Thanks so much, Nancy, for inviting me to Microsoft's Race and Technology Speaker Series. And thanks so much, Brittany and Will, for coordinating back-end logistics. Today, I'd like to build on some of the questions provo provoked by many of the amazing speakers that we've seen in the series. I'll share another perspective as a trained engineer and computer scientist and former software engineer who grew up believing that technology was a force for positive change, both to the economy and in terms of information access. I still hold this belief. However, technology has caused and is causing much harm despite potential benefits. Our past speakers have identified technology's disproportionate harm on black populations and other ethnic minorities and vulnerable groups. In the context of employment, housing and lending, I've seen firsthand how algorithmically biased results replicate and perpetuate racial discrimination and social inequalities seen in society. While there are countless reasons for these results, I believe this is primarily due to the lack of diversity in ethnic, racial, and gender, among other factors in Silicon Valley, the Western, educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic, or weird populations that we get our data from, and who gets to conceptualize and speculate new technologies. Most of my research has addressed the question, how might we better design and deploy technologies to support racially and ethnically minoritized populations? For context, minoritized refers to the exclusionary practices of more dominant groups and the racism minority racial ethnic groups experience. Much of my work has taken place in the context of Southeastern Michigan and primarily Detroit. To give you a few facts to illustrate our context, the city of Detroit has a population of roughly 639,000 people, 80% of whom are black. The average age is about 35. Detroit has the highest rate of people living below the poverty line out of all US cities with populations of at least 100,000. And its poverty rate is more than three times that of the US. 
Detroit has been experiencing an economic decline for many years, in part due to the collapse of the auto industry. For context here, to work in manufacturing, college degrees weren't required. And while manufacturing employment has declined, we know that the number of jobs requiring a college degree has risen. In fact, while 81% of Detroiters have a high school degree or higher, only a small percentage have a bachelor's degree or higher. This population describes many of the job seekers who participated in our research. Unless otherwise specified, our job seeker participants have been primarily African Americans looking for a job in the last six months at the time of the study. We also focused on those job seekers with a median income of less than $35,000 per year and less than a four-year college or four-year degree, although many of our job seekers earn less than $25,000 annually. Before I begin, I'd like to start with a story of a zip car deployment circa 2015. For context, thousands of Detroiters must travel each day to low paying jobs in suburban communities. However, approximately 35% of Detroiters don't own cars. Those who do often struggle to pay for high insurance costs and maintenance. So innovative transportation solutions like Zipcar should work. Debbie, a staff member, described how Zipcar was deployed and later removed from her, from her neighborhood. So a car was left in front of their office for a few months. There wasn't a representative from Zipcar to introduce themselves. There was no introduction to what Zipcar was or what Zipcar represented as a company. They just left the car there. So then after a few months, they took the car away because no one used it. So this action exemplifies how companies deploy technologies in minoritized communities, and it helps to set the stage so that we can begin to rethink technology deployment in addition to design and implementation. So through a set of case studies, I hope that you walk away from the talk with insight on how Zipcar might have been deployed to be more accessible to a community that stood to benefit greatly from it. In the first case study, I'll share briefly how we use participatory design to educate participants about the digital sharing economy and got feedback on its feasibility. After learning the pros and cons of the sharing economy, we dug deeper to understand what employment tools would best support our job seekers. We asked participants this question directly. After hearing about their key challenges, we designed ReviewMe, an application to provide resume feedback. However, we made a few missteps, which I'll discuss. I'll conclude with efforts to design, employments, it, to design employment tools with our population. The process of designing with is beneficial in itself. As we saw, it was empowering. And now I'll discuss the first case study, an investigation that explored the promise of the sharing economy and employment opportunities using these platforms. The sharing economy focuses on the sharing of underutilized assets for free or for a fee. While people share everything from rides to cars and spaces, I was primarily interested in opportunities for people to provide their services and skills. I wanted to explore the sharing economy's potential for providing economic benefits such as jobs, learning new skills, saving money, and providing access to social networks and their benefits. These were the positive aspects of the sharing economy. However, we recognized the disadvantages. Even when we started this work in 2015, there were unfavorable working conditions, evidence of racial discrimination, and regulatory issues. Nevertheless, we wanted to explore what opportunities might exist to support employment and skill development for job seekers. Therefore, we turned to participatory design and held two workshops to bring job seekers together and have a conversation. Our workshop included 20 Detroiters who had been actively seeking employment for the past six months. And it's really important to note that we created physical artifacts of community applications of the sharing economy. We created personas and scenarios representing challenges identified in our past work. The scenarios describe situations that people face, like being formally incarcerated and needing a job or working odd jobs to pay for college. We use these as probes to answer questions among participants. We held workshops at a local Detroit community center that was accessible to the public and also off the bus lines. I'm not gonna go into study details, but a goal of the workshop sessions was really to educate our communities about the sharing economy and discuss its potential from an employment perspective. 
We explain sharing economy application examples like Lyft because of the opportunities to be a driver and also to get rides to go to work. We looked into TaskRabbit, which enabled people to get paid for their services. Again, I'm not going to go into the details of the work. Um, this paper is accessible um, as supplementary materials to the talk. Uh, but I really want to call out that sometimes we take the time out in these participatory design sessions to understand what technology means from, a pers from our participants' perspective and share our understanding so that we're all on the same page. We created these workshop packets so that people could respond to certain prompts. So as a group, the primary goals were to explore, evaluate, discuss, and provide researchers with feedback to help us understand the feasibility of these applications for not only individuals, but also from the perspective of the persona so that we could kind of step out of ourselves and think about these questions from someone else's perspective, then our own perspectives, and then finally, the perspective of our communities. So each group was assigned a sharing economy application and asked questions um, that first asked them to imagine how their persona might feel in terms of working as a Lyft driver or using Lyft. We also asked the same question, again, to, to them individually. And similarly, for TaskRabbit, we asked, what services might this persona provide? What services would you provide? To ensure everyone actively participated in the sessions, everyone had a role. And at the end of the group discussions, the elected group presenter shared their findings with all at attendees. So different roles included timekeeper, we had a facilitator for the session, and as I mentioned, uh, a group uh, presenter. So presenters described their assigned application and discussed whether it was feasible and why for their communities. The rest of the participants were free to respond. So you can imagine that we had a larger conversation and this presented an opportunity for all groups to discuss what their assigned sharing economy application was. Um, it was an opportunity for them to discuss the, um, the, the issues and points that were raised in their groups and also how they felt personally. And again, others could respond. So this was a, a conversation. Overall, a few participants had heard of Uber and Lyft. One person had actually used Lyft at the time, so they were an early adopter. Uh, we used literature that provided several principles that were necessary for the sharing economy to work. And most of these principles were met. There were no key issues regarding trust between strangers, idling capacity, or belief in the commons. In terms of employment, participants expressed how the sharing economy could strengthen offline relationships and connect them to people who could provide them with employment feedback. They were excited about exchanging skills within their communities and even bartering services. This would also enable them to advertise their skills within the community. However, there were some concerns uh, with some of the applications that were being discussed. So on one hand, participants described the advantages of increased collective efficacy and increased connections through the sharing economy. So collective efficacy, in short, is the feeling that your community has some control over the environment. So I'm from a, a small town in North Carolina. I'm from Eastern North Carolina, and I grew up in a neighborhood where if I went out as a child and I misbehaved, and by the time I got back home, people would, my parents would know what happened. People would tell my parents what I was up to. And so I lived in a neighborhood that was very high in collective efficacy. So on the other hand, some participants felt that the sharing economy would fail in communities with lower collective efficacy. Or in this case, in, in the case of Detroit at the time, these were neighborhoods with high transiency. And so they call this out as a potential problem. And so while participants were excited to provide and offer services, they expressed an explicit desire to be self-sufficient. They were willing to lend items, but not necessarily willing to borrow from others. This is consistent with prior literature stating that low-income populations have strong norms against constantly taking more than one can give. Participants distrusted aspects of the sharing economy related to the monetary transactions and to sharing their personal data. For example, participants were hesitant to pay using their cell phones. They were hesitant to provide their location um, and provide a link from the sharing economy applications to other accounts like Facebook, uh, and also reluctant to, to display their photos or to share their photos. And so this finding corresponds to past research finding that mistrust prevents African Americans from using internet tools for fear of access to personal information such as race, age, and gender, 
uh, for fear of, of things like discrimination. So these these early issues, these issues are coming out in, 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 this, in this setting. The reputation system built into applications such as Lyft and Airbnb was also confusing. Though service providers of the sharing economy were being ranked by consumers, our participants thought that the system or the platform itself provided the ratings. And so they wanted to see that personal connection, not a system connection for exchange. So for example, one of our participants stated in response to worker reviews in TaskRabbit, I don't know what I think about that because I know people and if they don't know you, they aren't too receptive. You have to be referred to by somebody. So they wanted to see where these ratings were coming from. They wanted to know who made this, this rating. Again, you know, the platform could be discriminatory. I don't know if I can actually trust these ratings. So they wanted to see transparency in, in who's actually providing them. Finally, our participants stated that item exchanges required a safe place to conduct exchanges. So in this case, we had a sharing economy application called Neighbor Goods, and Neighbor Goods basically allows people to share items um, using the platform. And so this finding actually reminded me of Prof Professor Kashana Gray's discussion of neighborhood women who voluntarily escorted kids to the library to ensure safety. So in our case, our participants felt that the police or fire stations could serve as a safe place of exchange. So in part two of this same study, we facilitated a design and innovative session or innovation session. And this session, we simply asked participants what they wanted. We gave the following prompt. If you could talk to the developers of the sharing economy, what would you tell them to design, build, or create for you based on your current employment situation? Or what would you even design for yourself? And so they were encouraged to think about how you currently look for employment and how to improve the process. We also encouraged participants to feel free to improve upon the applications that they had heard of in the session or to generate ideas for entirely new applications. At the end of the session, teams and individual team members reported their results. We found from this part of the study that job seekers needed direction and would value the creation of tech tools to provide job application feedback. They wanted clarification about the necessary skills to secure employment and where to obtain those skills. Such attributes were unavailable from digital employment technologies at the time. And so the bottom line was that job seekers could land interviews, but they never landed the jobs and they didn't understand why. When asked what companies could do to support their employment, they wanted to hear why they didn't get the job and what, again, what they needed to do to land the job from the employers. So I want to get more employer feedback. And so thus, our next steps included building a minimum viable product for tools that could provide job seekers with feedback. To adjust the limitations of insufficient feedback, we conceptualized ReviewMe, an application to connect unemployed individuals to employed individuals to strengthen the social networks and the employment process. We followed an in-depth user-centered design process. We conducted interviews with HR professionals and trainers who work with job seekers experiencing marginalization and job seekers who are living under, in under-resourced areas. We also observed the employment intake process at a Southeastern uh, Michigan Career Center. We conducted surveys and contextual inquiries with an early version of our application and interviews with job seekers. Finally, we made several iterations over our concept based on results of these initial investigations. I'll first discuss our initial results among our students, who were indeed coming from a Western, educated, industrialized, rich, and demographic, democratic, democratic, democratic perspective. So yes, uh, our, our students were weird, and sorry for saying that, but yes, students were from weird populations, but we just wanted to test, you know, does our product work? And the students' feedback was relatively positive. Students loved ReviewMe. They liked the anonymity of receiving feedback and held the perception that feedback was more honest. They received constructive feedback from strangers rather than careful fee feedback from friends who didn't want to hurt their feelings. However, our work wasn't focused on students. What we found through our recruiting efforts alone was that very few job seekers had access to digital resumes. Most had physical copies available. 
Some job seeker participants saved their resumes on public computers and eventually lost them due to system upgrades. Others stored resumes on USB flash drives, but these devices were often lost or stolen. Some individuals had physical copies of their resumes, but they left them at home. We found from our recruiting efforts alone that participants had difficulties with registration and one-on-one -on -one in person assistance was needed. Our registration process required users to confirm their email addresses, and we saw that patrons serve, they searched for their email addresses, and upon finding them, they couldn't remember their passwords. Many used text-based password retrieval to log into their accounts. One participant did not understand how to convert resumes to PDFs, and one of the researchers walked him through this process. We also saw challenges related to low digital and reading literacy. Finally, many participants who were returning citizens or people who were previously incarcerated had trouble identifying their skill sets. We saw that these participants submitted resumes that were less than 500 words, and 500 words was the minimum requirement for most resume systems. So we spent time uh, supporting uh, these job seekers and um, adding content to their resumes. So I mentioned that we started this research interviewing experts, we observed career centers, and we evaluated our deployment among our students. However, this work failed to uncover key contextual factors among certain unemployment segments. It became clear to us how we had been designing for participants. After much reflection, we got ahead of ourselves. There wasn't a need for us to have, have even built anything at this point. We could have assessed the concept flow alone. And so our recruiting observations and contextual interviews identified factors such as limited technology access, which past literature had discussed. However, we were astonished that participants did not have digital resumes. I mean, especially given that in order to, to participate in the job market, you, everything was, was digital. So we were surprised that job seekers were unable to complete our registration process because this was standard. And it was standard among most job sites, if not all of them. So why, you know, why hadn't we seen this from our observations? Why, why didn't we catch this in our contextual interviews or even see it in prior literature? So in reflecting on why we failed to identify these factors in our initial research, um, we believe it's because the contextual inquiries took place at a career center computer lab and it became evident that those patrons were prepared to upload their resumes. However, at the time of our study, we weren't able to solicit from uh, the same participant pool because we were conducting an assessment. So perhaps this was a, a blessing in disguise. Uh, previously, we were only observing, not intervening. Thus, we recruited from our local libraries and even at bus stops for the assessment piece of our work. And so it was then that we encountered registration and, and login issues. So we saw that not everyone had a digital resume and, and all of this was concerning. I think what was most alarming about our misstep and about our finding overall was that the same population segment, you know, these were segments that were un unable to submit or likely unable to submit basic employment applications or file for unemployment without some, some level of handholding. And so the question becomes, where do they go for this handholding? What, what happens here? And so we posited then, and, and we see today, that these job seekers would likely face other barriers, such as signing up for healthcare or conducting searches for inexpensive housing. Our findings are echoed today in difficulties seen for people needing to sign up for COVID vaccines. And so at this point, we decided to go back to the drawing board. We needed to go beyond designing for. We redesigned ReviewMe to consider challenges with logging in and adding physical resumes to the tool. We assessed other concepts that we had brainstormed after reviewing HCI literature and thinking about the issues uncovered in our own formative work. Therefore, we decided to conduct a speed dating study to evaluate these tools. And so our study drew heavily on our formative work and a review of the HCI literature at the time. And so HCI is human computer interaction for those of you who, who might not be aware of the term. Um, we sought to understand what tools had already been developed and whether there were additional hardships among job seekers. Based on these results, we created short storyboards to convey 10 employment concepts designed to address some of the needs and challenges. Upon generating these concepts, we conducted the speed dating study to assess and rank the value of these tools. So we wanted to understand how job seekers prioritize the tools. 
And so a re review of HCI research in the space identified additional job seeker barriers such as low wages and homelessness. And from this review, we categorized the challenges as personal, social, and societal. Past work reinforced the need for social connections and the need to support societal level issues such as wage theft and employee rights. We also identified the lack of transportation infrastructure in our past work as societal issues. And so you can see the 10 um, storyboard concepts or the, the 10 concepts that we brainstormed here and um, how we uh, allocated you know, these, these concepts into the personal, social, and societal categories. In some cases, we were making guesses in our brainstorming sessions. And in this case, we, we, had, we acknowledged that we were still designing for. We, we didn't have job seekers in, in the brainstorm. But in other cases, we included concepts that we got from our participatory design workshop. So these were stemming from the design workshop. So you know, for example, we included Review Me, which addressed personal and social challenges. There was another tool that um, our participants uh, conceptualized in our participatory design session. Um, which was uh, an, an interview uh, review tool. So similar to Review Me, in, instead, of inter, um, instead of reviewing resumes, uh, participants were asking to, to get feedback on their interviews. And so Review Me connected job seekers to volunteers, which was the social aspect of the tool, who could review their resumes and provide direct feedback. So this is the personal side of the tool. So we thought of Review Me and the um, interview tool as being both per personal and social. And so our storyboards look like this and included simple scenarios representative of our own past work and past literature from our field. Another tool we developed for personal was Skills Identifier, which is shown here. So Skills Identifier is a tool that helps job seekers identify and communicate skills. So in this case, we're, we're you know, conceptualizing Skills Identifier based on some of the challenges that we saw in, um, the, in the deployment of ReviewMe. So again, we had uh, job seekers who had a really hard time identifying skills and, and getting more than 500 words on their resume. So a tool like S Skills Identifier would, would help with this step. Finally, we included tools that address societal issues, such as the lack of transportation and the need for babysitting services. And so what did we find? We found that the top three concepts included Review Me. So this was good because we are confirming our, you know, our past results. Um, so Review Me was ranked one, Skills Identifier was ranked two, and Dream Gigs was ranked three. And I'll talk about Dream Gigs later. So first, the most salient result was the overwhelming preference for employment tools that address job seekers' personal and most immediate needs. So again, this is resume feedback, support for articulating job skills, and help determining concrete paths to achieve career goals. This confirmed our earlier results. Most, if not all, of our job seekers needed a resume to land a job. Our participants primarily wanted to receive feedback on how to tailor their experiences to different industries. While a few participants noted that they were able to get similar feedback from job centers, they also noted that they didn't always have a means to reach the center. So again, we're seeing transportation as a barrier. Our participants described going through career transitions and skills identifier could help them identify related skills and transfer the related experiences during the process of career transition. The third rank concept was Dream Gigs, which is a tool that supports job seekers in determining concrete paths to meet their goals. Whereas skills identifier helped job seekers understand the skills that they currently had, Dream Gigs let job seekers know what skills they needed to reach their ideal job. Dream Gigs additionally showed job seekers what jobs they could pursue to reach their ideal job. And participants sought a path to reach their desired careers, and Dream Gigs provided them with this path. Interestingly, the other social applications were ranked among the lowest because job seekers did not see value in building online identity and did not have strong social networks. So Media Tutorial was a concept to help job seekers develop a professional online identity. And that was ranked as our, our lowest concept. Uh, this was because participants believed that social branding was not needed for the types of jobs that they held. And this aligned with past literature stating that identity branding is not as effective as some white collar workers believe. And is less effective than social ties who can vouch for one's ability to be an effective employee. This work supports our participants' belief that there is little value for them in social branding. 
Finally, participants did not have the resources needed to address some of their challenges, such as gaps in their resume, limited digital access, and low digital literacy. So to summarize, our job seekers prefer tools that address their most personal and immediate needs. Confirming past research, job seekers did not have access to strong social networks and therefore disliked concepts that required them. Finally, job seekers faced challenges such as gaps in their resumes, digital access, and low digital literacy confirming prior research. Our next step was to develop out the other two top ranked tools, so Skills Identifier and Dream Gigs. We also wanted to redeploy Review Me Among Job Seekers, so we wanted to give ourselves another, another chance. I'm not gonna go into the specific details of our longitudinal deployment, but I will give you a summary uh, in the next slide, and I can answer any questions in our Q&A. So in our one-month field deployment, we used Amazon's Mechanical Turk to automate the feedback, and we tried to address some of our earlier findings to bridge the digital literacy gap. Note that we reached out to 131 job seekers in this study, and only 23 finished. So there were various reasons for which we can discuss later, um, the best being that job seekers found jobs, and so they didn't have time uh, for our study. Uh, other reasons included, you know, we just couldn't, we couldn't reach out to them, so phone numbers change um, and, you know, within a period of, of one month, so in some cases we couldn't contact them. So despite our efforts to bridge the digital literacy gap with this tool, we still encountered barriers. For example, it was still necessary for job seekers to log in. We accepted pictures of resumes. However, we still experienced challenges with this step. So even though you can take a picture of your resume, you still need to upload the file, right? And so that wasn't as seamless as what we had imagined. Uh, again, some people didn't remember their passwords while others didn't have resumes to upload. So part of our study included, again, helping job seekers to create their resumes. And like we found in our first study, there was some shepherding that was required. Nevertheless, for those job seekers who did complete our study, we found that positive feedback fostered job seekers' self-reflection and improved self-confidence and perceived social support. So in the next case study, I describe our approach developing dream gigs. This time, I'd argue that we were really designing with job seekers. So as a reminder, Dream Gigs is a digital tool for job seekers to identify jobs and also volunteer opportunities that are aligned with their career goals. Learning from our earlier deployments um, of Review Me and, and Skills Identifier, we took an agile design development approach with Dream Gigs, which spanned five months and consisted of three sprints. I'm gonna spend time describing the approach we took to design and implement the system with job seekers and how this resulted in implications for mitigating aspects of powerlessness. So I'll provide a quick overview of the initial version of the tool, which was developed from the concepts I described in our original speed dating study. The tool consisted of three main pages. So the first page was a simple homepage, which allowed users to enter their most recent job and also enter their dream job. Page two shows the available gigs. Uh, note that we hard-coded the location. Um, we, didn't, we didn't know if job seekers would actually have transportation to um, areas outside of Detroit, so we hard-coded Detroit. Finally, we presented job seekers with a list of gigs from Craigslist. Following implications from our previous work, we wanted to keep the, the tool simple, so we avoided logins um, and, and uh, you can see there's no registration uh, required for this tool. So it's a, a very simple tool. We followed an agile methodology in our approach. Again, it spanned five months and consisted of three sprints. And our sprints consisted of evaluating the current version of the tool, iterative development, and receiving design insights. We started by first conducting a small scale assessment or usability test with social workers in sprint one who evaluated the initial concept. We then updated the tool and conducted another evaluation with our targeted job seekers, and we concluded with another round of semi-structured interviews with a mix of new and older job seekers. So in the first sprint, we learned the importance of finding the right gigs in terms of what was practical, reliable, and flexible from the participants' perspectives. Recall that we recommended gigs from Craigslist, and we sought feedback from social workers. The five social workers suggested reliable gigs and going through more formal and professional job sites like Indeed. They described Craigslist's gigs as being untrustworthy 
And in fact, in going through the results, we saw examples of inappropriate jobs and requests. They also felt that the recommended gigs weren't aligned with the skills that job seekers needed to develop. So flexibility and scheduling and time was also a concern that our social workers mentioned. And they requested that we provide job seekers with volunteer opportunities as these were more flexible. So recall in the original version that we defaulted to specifying jobs in Detroit, but we learned that job seekers should have the option to search in specific cities, so we, we changed that. So for Sprint 2, we updated the tool to provide users with a list of intermediate occupations after users selected up to three skills to develop. We did this using the Data at Work API, which you can learn more about in our paper. And the API provided the top 10 most related occupation titles, which we used to present to our job seekers. We also used Indeed's API to search for jobs and Volunteer Matches API to search for volunteer opportunities we eliminated our Craigslist results. And so after testing this version with actual job seekers, we found that they liked the intermediate occupation list. One participant noted that they served as building blocks to acquire skills along the way. Participants liked selecting the job from our tool and immediately being able to apply to a job. Job seekers were also excited about volunteering and thrilled to see these opportunities help in their skill development. Therefore, for the final sprint, we introduce ONET's classification of knowledge, skills, and abilities. To address navigation issues, we incorporated a welcome page and many tutorials. Finally, job seekers liked the classification of knowledge, skills, and abilities, which we color coded to support usability. So to give you a walkthrough of the final design tool, job seekers were introduced to the application at the home page. So job seekers told us that they didn't, they didn't wanna just go into a, a site and, and not know what to do. They actually wanted an introduction to the tool. So we added this, this welcome page. They then provided their recent job as they did before. So in this case, let's say they enter construction laborers. Users then enter their dream job or the job that they would like to obtain. And let's say uh, they want to um, go from being a construction uh, laborer to an accountant. And so finally, participants entered their geographic location, which was new. And so we tapped into the Data at Work API, which provided the skills a construction laborer has and also the skills that an accountant needs. We see on the screen what job seekers needed to develop by subtracting the current skills from the needed skills. So job seekers can then select the skills they wish to gain. Here, let's say users select economics and accounting from the knowledge category and mathematical reasoning from the skills category. So taking and inputting these skills back into the Data at Work API provides us with a list of jobs that job seekers could do to obtain those skills, which we see here. We also allowed job seekers to select one related occupation to see the jobs in their area. For example, someone could select correspondence clerks. Finally, after selecting one of the related jobs, job seekers can check if this job or related jobs are available in their area. So here we're pulling available jobs through Indeed. So now that you see how the final tool worked, I'll discuss the results of our final sprint, which revealed a process of personal empowerment as a result of job seekers' use of the tool. So before describing the personal employment, I'm sorry, before describing the personal empowerment process, I'll first define power. Aaron defines power as something, anything which makes or renders somebody able to do, capable of doing something. And according to Lord and Hutchinson, personal empowerment processes are those where individuals create or are given opportunities to exert control of their destiny and decisions that impact their lives. The process consists of five stages. And we use these stages to frame our findings. So we go from the point of experiencing powerlessness to gaining awareness, which is the impetus to the empowerment process. And as we become aware, we have a better understanding of our strengths and our capacities and alternatives to our feelings of powerlessness. We become aware of and begin to consider new directions for our lives. And once we learn new roles, we gain access to value resources and are given a sense of control over our own environment. Initiating participation advances the personal empowerment process because participation itself is empowering. 
finally, contributing enables individuals to find ways and opportunities to contribute to their communities and exert influence, which increases individual self-efficacy, feelings of value, and sense of control. In support of learning new roles, dream gigs help job seekers expand their outlook. By displaying jobs available through Indeed and Volunteer Match, Dream Gigs help to expand job seekers' career choices and opportunities while identifying possible routes to attain their goals. We saw how learning about volunteer opportunities not only supported their knowledge of new roles, but also flexibility through volunteering and opportunities to network. Per Carla, that with me becoming a volunteer, it would put me in the network of meeting people that can help me along the way, whether it's advice or putting in a good word for my efforts. In the first three stages of the empowerment process, dream gigs allow job seekers to identify a clear pathway to reach their ideal job and provided them with employment opportunities and opportunities nearby, which encourage job seekers to initiate further actions. Dream gigs also help job seekers to plan and set a clear direction. Per Patsy, I felt like there was enough information for me to look forward to this week, to setting some new goals. And we've talked about some of this in our work where a lot of the tools that are available don't allow people to reflect on the process. And dream gigs, we're seeing from, from Patsy here that, that she's able to set goals. So instead of applying to 100 jobs on Indeed, you know, there's a way for, for people to, to plan or at least think through this process. Finally, our agile and user-centered design approach allowed our participants to engage and therefore contribute throughout the design process. Participants proposed new features and evaluated each design updated. They also volunteered to share dream gigs with their communities. According to Bob, I didn't think it was going to be like this, but it was cool to have a hands-on experience with it and give some input on what I think would be good and what would not be good. It made me feel important, like what I have to say means something. That's how I feel. I feel like my opinion matters. We drew several design implications to support the empowerment process. First, providing job seekers with new information, especially a direct connection to resources, supported gaining awareness and their learning of new roles. This initiated action taken. However, I think our biggest takeaway was what we've learned from the contributing stage. We saw how we as researchers could empower participants by letting them know how they contributed to our design processes and listening to them throughout the process. Some participants were involved at several iterations of this project, including the original storyboard concepts. Seeing how they contributed to this process helped to raise their self-efficacy as well. Therefore, we learned to support empowerment from this work by incorporating design processes that communicate to people how their voices contribute to technology and back to their communities. We learned to find ways to connect job seekers to volunteer organizations that could connect them to resources such as mentors, transportation, and education. This tool also helped bridge digital literacy gaps because it didn't require login or uploads of any sort. Designing with in this case was an ongoing process, a continuous cycle between researchers and job seekers, and it was mutually beneficial. To wrap up my talk, let's think about what technology deployment, design and development could look like going forward. In our first case study, we introduced the sharing economy to community members in a workshop setting. We learned what they saw as the promise and perils of the sharing economy. They identified issues of discrimination and distrust of making payments online. While they noted some promises of the sharing economy, they cared most about getting employment, employer feedback from an employment perspective. We reflected on what it meant to design for, moving directly into development mode when hearing job seekers ask for feedback without inviting them in this process. Our deployment required shepherding and infrastructuring work. We helped job seekers create resumes and convert them to PDF so that they could use the tool. We learned that we had additional responsibility as researchers, designers, and developers than just simply dropping off a tool. After much reflection, we returned back to the drawing, well, we returned to the drawing board, we redesigned ReviewMe, and we conducted a speed dating study to understand job seeker prioritization better. We invited job seekers along to develop dream gigs. So in designing with, 
we learned the importance of connecting job seekers to resources through volunteers and the importance of having building blocks to set goals throughout the job search process. Finally, we saw that an iterative process that involved going back to communities for confirmation, for validation and recognition was associated with empowerment. I'd like to thank my research team, colleagues, my amazing colleagues, my amazing research team and collaborators, our amazing community partners, and of course, our amazing funders, the National Science Foundation, uh, U of M's public policy, and also U of M's uh, poverty solutions. I'm more than happy to take your questions, and if there are none, I've left a few thought questions for you. First, we can think about you know, who has agency or ownership in the design process. What are the assumptions that we make in our design process, and how can we shift power relations in the process of design, development, and deployment? In what ways can our approaches to research and design be more empowering? In what ways can we build individual and community capacity in our approaches? I'm looking forward to taking your questions. Thank you so much. That was so interesting. Um, I, gosh, it's so. In, I love. I love the way you just took us through a multi-year journey uh, that was both. Here's a series of studies and our findings, and they relate together, but also uh, a journey of methodology uh, and an evolution of methodological thinking. And we have some questions in the chat, and I would encourage folks to to throw in more questions. I want to. Return to method questions because I I have some I'd, I'd like to to ask. Um, but somebody asked a really specific question, which was why you spoke to social workers and what you hope to learn from social workers in particular. And I don't know what motivates that question, but I'd love to hear the answer. Yeah, thank you so much for your question, uh, which I love. Um, I have had the honor and pleasure uh, working with um, social work uh, students uh, at uh, U of M. I think U of M has probably the, the number one uh, social work uh, program. And, um, you know, we viewed social workers as experts in this space uh, who we were able to, to reach out to earlier on before evaluating um, uh, dream gigs in the process. So, you know, I talked about the, you know, review me when we um, reviewed it with students. And students didn't really have that context. We viewed kind of social workers as, as a replacement. Um, and I did in the chat, I'm not sure if this is published, I did kind of give a shout out to Desmond Patton, who wrote an article in Medium uh, uh, through a Safe Lab about why AI needs uh, more social workers and non tech um, uh, people uh, in the development. So, thank you for your question. Nice shout out to Desmond Patton, who's up next month in, in this lecture series. Um, so here, what happened in your, in your process from starting with Review Me and then going through this process and, and you threw that line in there that I think is so important, which is we never needed to build this. We <laughs> could have just done it conceptually. Um, and it, it raises the whole prospect of, of um, building something too soon in the process, right? And so I'm wondering, having been through this journey that you took us on, where do you, where do you start now? If, if somebody is your student and is going, I, I need to think, I want to design a better thing. What, what do you tell them about participatory design as you now understand it? Yeah, I mean, you know, just going back to the the example of um, uh, of of oh gosh, why can't I think of the zip car? <laughs> um, mm -hmm. You know, is is we could have had these participatory design sessions, community conversations and discussions, um, just to get you know insight. Like if you think about the insights that we gained out of that, I mean, I'm not you know I, I love sharing economy applications, but there are things that were identified early on in these sessions that were built into these tools. And so when students, you know, come to me, I, I ask them to, you know, show me, <laughs> you know, how does the, how does, you know, what the insights that you've gotten from participants inspire what it is that you've designed? Because a lot of times that's missing. <laughs> um, I would say that's one of the number one problems that I've seen in, in classes is it, you know, I, I, that connection isn't, isn't there. And so um, just having a process in which you're demonstrating, here's what you know I've created, here's what I'm thinking, and providing that iterative feedback, you know, as I said, that can be empowering in itself. 
Yeah, I really love that that point that the methodology can itself be a source of empowerment of the realization that one has something to contribute. And I was thinking it's sort of a skill building experience as well to to work with a design team and see how the process unfolds. It's Absolutely. it's really fascinating. Um, Detroit, I don't know uh, what your honorific is, Detroit, but um, having been faculty at Wayne State University, I appreciate your presence. Um, Detroit says, first, I'd like to thank Dr. Dillahunt for this talk and the research, and as a native Detroiter and as a member of the demographic being spoken about some of the time, it appreciates and is inspired by the work. And the question is, uh, and, and we had some other versions of this question come out, I don't know what kind of work you do, Detroit, but I'm just going to assume that you're in tech and you're working developing tools like this or in some part of the process of developing technologies. And so the question then is, is what are the kinds of improvements that could be made now on top of things that already exist? What's the kind of work that could be done to help people um, put the kinds of ideals that you're presenting into practice now to create change, whether in the design process or whether to shepherd people toward the kinds of resources that, that exist, but perhaps are not known to exist, like the Zipcar example? All right, first of all, uh, thank you, Detroit, for your question and shout out to Detroit. Um, yes, uh, I think that's a, a great question. I think this is something that we're uh, still working on. I mean, I kind of see this question as how do we bridge communities to industry, um, better bridge communities to uh, institutions like universities. And I'm super excited you know, to, to be sitting in at Microsoft to think of ways in which we can oper operationalize um, this. I think, I think this is an ongoing conversation um, and, and feel free to reach out to me if you want to continue this conversation. But, but this is you know, definitely a question that, that, that I, I constantly ask myself, like how do we build these bridges in an equitable manner, in an equitable manner? Yeah, it could be having bridges in the community to, to help with that. So we'll see. Um, we have a question asking, uh, during the creation of your study and the participatory design workshop activities and sessions, did decision fatigue ever come into consideration? And, and uh, the question is, how do you think evaluating this aspect of the population's day-to-day -day experiences might change researchers' approach to a future tech-focused study? I guess that's sort of asking, you know, was it if you're making decisions and doing things all day at the end of the day when you're going into something like this and you have to make more decisions, is that or did it? I don't know. Do you have any thoughts about decision fatigue and the role of that? We didn't really experience. Mm -hmm. I think I don't know if I'm biased as a researcher, you know, didn't really experience decision fatigue because, you know, I think of these decision points as almost opportunistic, right? These are questions that we, that, that are always um, being raised in which we need to, to, you know, think through and investigate more. So I didn't, I don't think I was tired of decision makings, but also their constraints that would probably introduce decision fatigue that uh, if someone's in, in a non-academic setting might present. Um, so if we have to deliver something right away, then then maybe that would play a role. But, but maybe I think I, I, I kind of think the person might have been asking more about uh, the participants experience. Oh, I see. I see. Team. I see. Oh, OK, that's a great point. Um, I, I mean, that's it's not anything that came up um, from what I've seen. Participants have appreciated, uh, you know, seeing how their input is actually um, implemented in, in the tool. Um, and again, we're working with, you know, a, a small number of, of participants. I think if we were working with a larger number, perhaps we would have seen that fatigue. Um, and even if we were working with a larger number, um, thinking about, you know, criteria, how will decisions be made and finding out from the community, um, you know, at what point is too much, like thinking about these things ahead of time would be something I would consider if, if that if that was a concern. Thanks. Um, here we have another question. Dr. Dillahunt, this is wonderful work. Uh, do you see value in sharing dream gigs to a student population, such as senior high school students, perhaps via career guidance counselors or those getting GEDs or even recent graduates to provide them with job and career direction? And if so, how can this happen to empower these communities? Thank you so much for your question. And, and absolutely, I mean, these are conversations that I've had kind of outside of 
um, uh, you know, th this work I've been working with uh, consulting firms out, you know, kind of outside of the, the work. And um, I think community colleges are also uh, a population who could benefit from something like dream gigs. And I think uh, the students, uh, when I present this work, are really excited about it as well. And I would say that there are, it's not quite dream gigs, but there are some forms of dream gigs and tools like LinkedIn, which none of the, the people that we've worked with use. Uh, um, LinkedIn offers, I won't say it's dream gigs, but they offer uh, resources that could be used in a similar way. Um, and so, yeah, you know, there, there are other, you know, professionals or other populations who are really taking advantage of that. And I, I think we've been seeing um, uh, community college students being onboarded to sites like LinkedIn. But I think high school, I, I feel like it's never too early to be thinking about these things. Um, yeah, so absolutely. And thank you for your question. Uh, we got a couple more and then we'll have to probably call it a day here. So uh, Danae, uh, Danae, I'm assuming that's Danae Ford Robinson. Hi, Danae. Thank you for being here. Uh, excellent talk. I'm really energized by how you built alongside the community. Um, and she asks, how do you recommend that tech organizers like Microsoft or Microsoft Research partner with communities? And, and how do, or better yet, how do you recommend we build meaningful and long-term relationships with communities? And I think I, I would like to uh, bundle that with Cindy Gross hashtag befriending dragons uh, question, which uh, says that I love that you brought in adaptive community leadership principles with lead which, which lead with relationships. Those most impacted need to set the direction. Uh, without the expectation they'll do the hard work of their own liberation, how do you suggest tech leaders hold themselves accountable to living into this? So I think combined, this is a question about what can we in technologies do to 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 build meaningful longer term relationships with communities so that uh, we can take on the load of the liberation rather than that of the people who are oppressed. Yeah, these are great questions. Thanks so much, Danae, and thanks so much, Cindy, um, for asking this. And I think this is uh, related to Detroit's question as well. Um, you know, I, I think being at the University of Michigan, you know, we have um, uh, Detroit URC, uh, the, the Urban Research Center, uh, which has a board that consists of community members. And um, as a researcher, we we present our work to the board, and the the board is trained in community-based participatory research and they they make those connections for us. So there's a, a bridge within um, the, the university and the, and the community um, that exists. And I would imagine um, that industry could create uh, something very similar to um, this uh, research center or this entity that is trained um, in equitable uh, approaches and, and methods uh, to developing technology um, who could serve as that, that bridge um, and also provide the resources. I think that maybe Cindy, you're getting at, I mean, it is a heavy lift uh, for, for populations to, to, to manage this. So, so that would be uh, my recommendation. Do you have any thoughts about the accountability element? How, how a leader can say, am I doing enough here? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> This iterative process of reflection and development with the communities is something that I think needs to be built into all processes um, and having that board. Um, uh, we have regular uh, check ins and updates where we're meeting together and, and asking that question. You know, are we doing what we said we would do? Are we holding our end of the, the bargain? Um, so constant check ins and constant reflection for sure with the communities. Yeah. All right, I cheated because we have two minutes left and I'm going to okay. drop a huge question on you. Um, just can, thinking about Kishana's talk that she gave last Kishana Gray's talk, which was great for those who, who did not see it, but it it also reflected the, the, the complexity of the lived daily lives and the enormity of the technological barriers. And I would love a pithy thought on the role of technology and the limits of technology in addressing the kinds of societal problems that technologies like these are, are um, stepping into? Yeah, I think that's a big question for two minutes. <laughs> I know, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, Step but I, mean, I think it's, a, it's an amazing uh, question. I mean, I think the first thing is acknowledging what you can't do, <laughs> acknowledging what technology, at least at this point, you know, cannot do, acknowledging the limits. Um, acknowledging, uh, you know, where we've failed uh, as technologists 
and um, try, you know, better understanding uh, from communities uh, what isn't working. Um, I think that's I think that's one small step in in answering this question. Uh, again, I'll you know push for more communicate, you know, communicating, working with the, the communities to find out, right? Opportunities to to reflect. Uh, I love that. Thank you. Perfect pithy answer, and thank you everybody for attending. And uh, look forward to talking with you more. And uh, if you're from Microsoft and you want to get engaged in this thinking, let us know. Thanks Thank so you. much, everybody. Yeah. Bye. Thanks, everyone.